This evening, I would like us to consider for the next little while the text, the scripture was so ably read and enunciated by Dr. Mary Wangai. I will repeat it again for the sake of euphony and appreciation. Exodus 15, 1, 23, and 24. Here's what it says. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. For he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider hath he thrown into the sea. And when they came to Marach, they could not drink the waters of Marach, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marach. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? I've given title to what I hope this evening to consider for the next little while. What happens after the praise subsides? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, what happens after the praise subsides? You'll find out in a little while. At its core... Exodus 15 is an exuberant psalm of praise. If ever there were a people who had experience that gave them an opportunity for demonstrative extravagant praise, surely it was the people of Israel. If ever there was a people who had a collective story to tell about God's redemptive activity, surely it was the people of Israel. If ever there was a people who could see for themselves a living example of God's bountiful grace. It was the people of Israel. If ever there was a circumstance in the whole of human history that undoubtedly showed the salvific hand of divine intervention into human affairs. Surely, it was the people of Israel. And so, when the people of Israel considered their present position, in relation to their prior plight, they could not help but get caught up in ecstatic and joyful celebratory praise. Now the reason for Israel's joyful praise is familiar to most who've gone through some suffering. And they know what it is for God to come in the midst of their suffering and deliver them. They can't help but praise the Lord as African Americans do and South Africans do because we know what oppression was all about. Now the reason... For Israel's joyful praise 
is that Israel had moved from the dire straits to an even worse situation. Famine swallowed up Israel. Crops failed. Vines bore no fruit. The streams, the brooks, the rivulets dried up. Sheep had no grass in which to graze for pleasant pastures. Had turned from fertile green to barren brown. And in response to this desperate situation, as I said this morning, Jacob sent his 12 sons to buy grain from Egypt. When Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt, they found their brother Joseph, whom they had sold into slavery. Joseph, as we would say back in the U.S., was living large in Pharaoh's palace, second only to Pharaoh himself and responsible for allocating all the food supplies in the grocery stores. Fast forward. After 350 years had passed, and all of Jacob's sons had died, there arose a new king over Egypt, which the Bible says, which knew not Joseph. For the next 400 years, this new king set up over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and made the children of Israel serve with rigor and they made their lives bitter with hard Blinding, blinding bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor and cruelty. Then somewhere, somewhere in the back streets of Goshen, a brown-skinned baby boy named Moses was born. God sent a baby who Pharaoh determined would not live, but whom the Hebrew midwives determined would not kill. God sent a baby. In the bulrushes of a little creek on the edge, hear me tonight, on a, in a little creek on the edge of the crocodile infested Nile. Then God in the middle of the river Nile arranged for a cross-cultural interracial adoption process that permitted an Israelite whom Pharaoh was trying to exterminate, he arranged for that Israelite to live in Pharaoh's home, <laughs> eat at Pharaoh's table, dress in Pharaoh's palace, in one of Pharaoh's bedrooms, and be taught by Pharaoh's best tutors in Pharaoh's universities. But now, after 400 years of blinding, grinding slavery, God, Almighty God, determined enough is enough. And the Bible says that God heard their groaning 
and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now God sent this same Moses to stand at the seat of Pharaoh to plead, let my people go. A burdened people were then able to throw off the shackles that had so long held them in the ignominy of their captivity. And so, my brothers and sisters of new life in this encampment, we now reach Exodus 15 and we find that the people of Israel, after they had crossed the Red Sea, they stood on the threshold of a land God had promised and they joyously recited in song what God had done. And the Bible says they sang with joy musical instruments that probably would not be permitted at New Life. Amen walls. Tambourine and drums. Come on, church. And they said, I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphantly, gloriously, he has hurled both horse and sea and rider into the sea. Pharaoh's army, he has hurled. They're singing and dancing and chanting and praising. The finest of Pharaoh's offers, officers, they sing, sang, are drowned in the Red Sea. And at the blast of your breath, this is a song I'm quoting, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood straight like a wall. And in the heart of the sea, the deep waters became hard as concrete. But God, you blew your breath and the sea covered your enemies. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. With Pharaoh's horses, Miriam and Aaron sang. Chariots and charioteers rushed into the sea that brought the waters crashing down on them. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And so they told their story over and over again. And they did so in song. And the Bible says in ecstatic praise. In fact, Exodus 15, 1 to 19 is popularly known as the Song of Moses. And these verses, my brothers and sisters, some of you who are looking at me cross-eyed, represent the jubilant, hello, ecstatic praise of Moses and the children of Israel. Moses was not alone in showing his jubilation, but when Moses was finished, his sister Miriam took over. And the praise, hear me church, the praise was so high and lasted so long that Miriam, the Bible says, lost her poise, her propriety, her sophistication. She took a timbrel in hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances with Moses and Miriam singing and the women dancing. High praise surely had engulfed the camp of Israel. Now, church, given their history of slavery and, and bondage, 
past. What they had endured for four centuries, high praise was understandable. I say it again. I said what the children of Israel had endured on the Pharaoh's whip. After they had been freed, high praise was understandable. They truly had something to praise and shout about. That's what the Bible says. But some would say, as some of you looking at me strange, would say that all this praising, all this dancing, all this shouting was a bit excessive. Surely, all they needed to do, the Adventists would say, was mention God's accomplishments once and be done with it. <laughs> Am I speaking truth? Yet, <laughs> two-thirds of this Exodus chapter, how much did I say? Two-thirds, pa brother pastor, records the rejoicing, the singing, and shouting about what Almighty God had done. Today, yes, today, some would say that contemporary praise practices are excessive, excessive and too Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, the praise just goes on and on and it gets on our nerves. And it seems like the shouting, I'm quoting some Adventists, like the shouting and the sound of drums and cymbals never comes to an end. Sometimes it looks like shouting and dancing have no rhyme or reason. That's why some people that I have pastored in the United States would lean over and whisper, it doesn't take all that to worship God. Is that familiar? Well, I must confess, and you have to forgive, you still love me? <laughs> I must confess, and I sincerely believe that it does take all that to worship God. For when you realize and you take cognizance of how far the Lord has been gracious and merciful and it brought you from the dungeons of hate, it does take all that. Yes, it takes all that. When you realize how far inside of ghettos and townships with rats running around and the Lord frees you, redeems you from the swamps and the roaches that you used to live around and how the good Lord came and pulled you out and lifted you up. It does take all that to praise the Lord. When you realize how far down in the water you were when you realize how close you came to drowning when you realize that it was nobody but God Jehovah Jireh who lifted your feet out of the miry clay and plant your feet on a rock to stay yes it does take all that to praise the Lord Mm -hmm. It does take all that. And I'm not at all puzzled by Israel's praise. But what does puzzle me, however, is the stark contrast of verses 15, chapter 15, 1 to 21, and verses 22 and 24, which says, So Moses... Brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And when they went three days in the wilderness. 
and found no water. When they came to Marach, now I'm not clearing my throat, I'm pronouncing it in the Hebrew, Marach, they could not drink the waters of Marach, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of that place was called Marach. Pronounce that, say it. Marach. Yes, that's your first Hebrew lesson. And the Bible says that the people murmured against Moses saying, What shall we drink? Hear me, church. In the first, in the twen first 21 verses, we find Israel celebrating. And shouting God's praises. And dancing and moving like the choir does sometimes. In rhythm. <laughs> Here the very same people. Murmuring. And had a negativity of spirit complaining. Because they were thirsty. That sounds a lot like church folk, doesn't it? After God has blessed you and you get just a little hung nail, ladies, you complain and want to diss God. Mm -hmm. As long as the Israelites could see their way, they celebrated and shouted. Yet as soon as the way got a little hard and the road got a little rugged and bumpy, they murmured. As long as everything was prepared for them, they shouted. They toy toyed. What do you call it? What lazy? What do you call it here? South Africans call it toy toy. And they, hoo -hoo -hoo, and they dance, yes. As long as everything was prepared, they toy toyed, they danced, they shouted. But as soon as they would have to exercise their own ingenuity, 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 and use their own determination, as soon as it looked like they would have to rely on a vision that was not their own. They murmured. As long as they had whatever they wanted. They shouted. They sang. They danced. They praised. As long as their needs were being met. They shouted. <laughs> they danced. They praised. As long as things were certain, as long as plans were set, and long as the destination was sure, they shouted, they danced, they praised. But as soon as the water ran out, they had an attitudinal metamorphosis. Young people, you know what that means. A complete change of attitude. Just as soon as things were not going the way they thought they ought to be going, the climate in the congregation changed. Just as soon. Can I preach this thing? Just as soon as it appeared that the appropriate travel arrangements had not been made, they took their eyes off the Lord and tried to get rid of a Kali. You know, Moses. I almost stumbled in the wrong name. Just as soon as it looked like there might be danger, difficulty ahead, the praise was over. Application. Let look, let's look at what happens when the praise is over. Upon examining this text, several, several realities about life become clear to this Negro. First and foremost, and most obvious, is that every 
life is marked by bitter water. Every life. When I arrived at O.R. Tambo on time to catch my plane, I'd been here before many times. Took the plane, arrived at Jomo Kenyatta, put my passport, pay my visa, got good entry. That was in my head. And I went this time, and I tried to get on the flight, and they said, no, e-visa. I said, what's that? I tried to do it on, the, on my phone, got, got blocked. That, to me, was bitter water. Are you listening to me, church? Bitter water. But when the children of Israel got to Marach, they discovered they could not drink the water because it was bitter. They were thirsty. But the water was polluted. Their throats, their throats were dry. Their lips were parched. But the water was contaminated. What I'm about to say to you, new life, may not be a very comforting thought. But we must realize as Christians that life is filled with bitter water. Somebody say amen. I wish I could tell you that your life would always be sweetness and light. I wish I could tell you that life is like a bowl of cherries. On the above four scoops of your favorite flavor of ice cream. Or that you'll be able to tiptoe successfully between the tulips. Uh-uh. Life, when you live long enough, life can give you some real bitter water. Life can give you hard pills to swallow. Life can throw you some curves. Set you back on your heels. We all know that some of life's best lessons are taught in the school of difficulty and hard knocks. In this life, young people, if you keep on living, you will have tribulations. Yes, there is some bit of water in life. When that thing that you planned for falls through, when that thing you've given your life for falls and fails, to find out that that child is using drugs or has become an alcoholic, and you don't know how it happened. That's bitter water. When some young lady close to your heart has been sexually harassed and raped by an officer in the church, that's bitter water. When the marriage you dreamed of and planned for winds up in the court for the nastiest of divorces that's bitter water are you listening to me tonight when your body insults you with sickness for which you are not prepared and you go to the doctors and the best physicians and they say uh-uh we can't help you. That's bitter water. Bitter water will surely present itself. But the question tonight is, the piercing interrogative is, what will we do when bitter water comes? Will we spend our time talking 
about how we've been victimized by the water? Hmm? Will we complain that nobody has to drink bitter water as we do? Will we castigate the leader as though the, the leader made the water? Hmm? Will we find somebody else to blame for the condition of the water? Will we put or, 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 how can I put this so you can understand? Will we put on our victim clothing and walk around complaining the man made us drink bitter water? Or will we pick up ourselves and stop being victims? Find a new relationship? Stop, hear me tonight, stop polluting our own environment. Learn the scientific formula for purifying water and clean up the bitter water for ourselves. God cannot help us unless we are willing to help ourselves. Somebody say amen. The problem in this text in this pericope is not really with the water. In fact, God did away with the problem by simply throwing a piece of stick in the water which sweetened it. The bitterness of the water was no longer an issue. The real problem here, would you like to know? I thought you would. Real problem here, which is evident by the shift from the celebratory shouting to murmuring and complaining. The problem then is there is sickness, Natalie, in the sanctuary. Are y'all listening to me? The text says, if it's in the book, what do we do? Take a look. <laughs> the text says, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands, keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord God who heals you. Somebody say amen. It's there in the book. Whenever there's an unnatural shift from shouting and praise. By the way, this is a practical sermon. You may not. You may not feel happy about it, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. Whenever there's an unnatural shift from shouting and praising to murmuring and complaining, you can be sure, bet your bottom dollar, no, your bottom shilling, that underneath it all, there's an element of sickness. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, he did so after giving them many signs. Most prominently, the plagues that consumed the land. And one of the signs was turning the rod into a snake. Are you listening to me? The snake is a symbol of Satan. And whenever... There is confusion about whether to shout and praise or complain. Satan is lurking somewhere in the church. Amen, Ruth, help me. Satan is lurking. And whenever Satan is present, sickness is not very far behind. God sent how many plagues? Ten in all. First water turned to blood. Then frogs covered the land. And even invaded 
Pharaoh's bedrooms and his ovens. The dust became insects and filled the air. And there were flies, plagues on the livestock, and boils on animals and humans. Hail destroyed the crops. Locusts devoured and hail left. Darkness came over the land of Egypt. And death of the firstborn. Now when this, these plagues, hear me church. These plagues were intended for God's enemies. The Egyptians. And I believe with all my heart that when Israel stopped praising and murmuring, that indicated a deficiency in their spiritual defense system that made them susceptible to the same kinds of diseases that victimized Pharaoh. Did you get it? Should I say it again? I'll say it again. These plagues. Let me take some dawah. I'm revived. These plagues. These plagues. Were intended for whom? Egyptians. I sincerely believe. That when Israel stopped praising. And started murmuring. And complaining. This indicated a deficiency in their spiritual defense system that made them susceptible to the same kinds of diseases that victimized Pharaoh. You see, the sickness began in Pharaoh's house. And Israel had reached to a point where the same plagues that visited Pharaoh's house was about to visit them. It is possible to live so close to people that you can catch their diseases. On the other hand, not all sickness in the church begins on the outside. Some sickness comes, can I say it, from within the church. Yes. There are some psychotic flies in the church. There are some neurotic insects in the church. There are some schizophrenic frogs in the church. There are some hellions. Hellions. You know what's a hellion? It comes from the noun hell. There's some hellions that constantly raise hell in the church. Maybe not here. And once the praise stops and starts to murmuring, sickness is allowed to enter. But thanks be to God. I said thanks be to God. Where there is sickness, we don't have to remain in that condition. I got to give you some hope tonight. Because there's an opportunity for healing. You know, I see a number of pastors, I see a number of interpretations of this text. One interpretation suggests that we don't have to be sick. Because God says, if thou will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and do that which is right in his sight, he will give air to his commandments and keep, if we keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you. As long as I remain faithful in my relationship with God, none of these diseases will be put on my life. Hear me tonight. Some sickness, because I'm human, I came from Adam and Eve. I cannot avoid. Because I'm a mortal person. Made of flesh and blood. But there's some other sickness. That I can avoid. Simply by being. In a right. Relationship with my creator. Somebody say amen. I told some folk the other night. 
When I took my, la my second to last checkup, health checkup in the States, they took me through, through everything. And the doctor said, you are pre-diabetic. I said, me? Uh-uh. I go to the gym. I walk. I play a little basketball. Try to run around in the soccer field. But I believe I inherited that from my father and my grandmother because they were diabetics. He said, no, the problem is not heredity. The problem is in the plate. Y'all didn't get it. Just slow. The problem is in what? Uh -huh. And some of our problems is in the plate. I'll, I'll move on from that. <laughs> and so I come to church, to this camp meeting. And because I know there's an opportunity for me to be healed. Authentic worship, you know, authentic worship has therapeutic spiritual value in that it leads to individual and collective healing. When I come to church, I'm not seeking anything on the surface. When I come to church, I don't come to set traps to undermine leadership and target especially the pastor. When I come to church, I'm not seeking a momentary catharsis. When I come to church, I am not seeking a spiritual placebo that will trick me into thinking I am better off than somebody else. Rather, when I come to church, I'm looking for someone to diagnose my sinful situation and to prescribe the right medicine that will put me on the right spiritual path. Yes! Hallelujah, yes! Whenever I come to church at Santon, I don't expect God to do something for me. He does something for me every day of the week. When I come to church, I give myself back to God. And I praise him. Are you listening to me? You don't come to church to get some. You bring. Because God gave you life. Oxygen. Come on. Blood. Breath. Food. Come on. God walks with you. Talks with you. Protects you from those crazy matatu drivers. When you come to church, give God your best. Praise him. You don't like this kind of preaching. <laughs> when Jesus healed the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, he asked him, son, do you want to be made whole? Likewise, when we go to church, expect Jesus to be ready to heal you and to turn your life around. Don't come to church if you don't want your life to be changed. Don't get into the water if you don't plan to have an attitudinal metamorphosis. When I come to church, I come to celebrate God's goodness and as a result, I get healing. I am looking for showers of blessings. I'm looking for a balm in Gilead. I'm looking for healing for my body. Healing for my dirty mind. When this camp meeting is over, I'll be happy if somebody come and tell me. Or can I tell somebody, whereas once I was blind, now I see like the woman with the issue of blood which was a cursed uterine discharge, a serious hemorrhaging of blood. I want, like that woman, to touch the hem of his garment. I want my head anointed with oil 
my cup running over. And if my cup can't hold it, I'll take from my saucer. I didn't come to shout for the sake of shouting. I came to shout and to praise in anticipation of and as a consequence of my sin sickness being healed. The bitterness of the water, which was in part the precipitating cause for the murmuring, was indicative, Dr. Mary, of an internal deficiency in Israel's spiritual immune system that showed up as a spiritual virus and then became full-blown disease that revealed the fact, Natalie, there was sickness in the sanctuary. In spite of the apparent sickness, just wait, just wait, God says to us tonight, you don't have to be sick. None of these diseases will come upon you. Campers, just remain in a proper personal relationship with the God who brought you out of spiritual Egypt. Therefore, the text not only implies that you have an opportunity for healing, but you must remember tonight to remain open to a relationship to the one who is in the source of the healing. There's no, hear me tonight, there is no healing apart from the healer. God says, if there's going to be healing, any healing in our lives, any purpose in our praise, any healing in the sickness that is prevalent in new life, we need to be aware of the one who's doing the healing. And this is what he says. I'm going to get done. This is what he says. I am the Lord that heals you. And this is the only place that I know. I'm not saying the only place. This is the only place I know where Jehovah Rapha can be found in scripture. It means that your God, my God, our God has charge and control over the healing process. Hallelujah. I know in this modern technological age, some of you are impressed with this thing called genetic cloning. I'm aware that some of you are impressed and amazed by scientific advancement with the human genome that enables people to unravel the mysteries of the human genetic footprint. But beyond our amazement, we must know tonight that God, Almighty God, is the one who created the genome in the first place. What scientists and us mortals are trying to do is to get where God has already been. I am the Lord that heals you. I may not understand or have a clue of the human genome thing. I don't, may not understand, and I don't. But I do understand that when I get sick, are you listening to me? When Parkinson gets sick, God comes and brings medicine in my bedroom. <laughs> the slaves back in southern United States used to sing it this way, come in the room. Come in the room. King Jesus is my doctor. He writes all my scriptures. He brings me all my medicines when he comes in the room. I understand that Jesus is a doctor who has never lost a patient. And I do understand that he has more medicine in the hem of his garment than any pharmacy in Nairobi. <laughs> I do understand that he has healing in his touch. But what do you do when the praise is over? Would you still like to know? Huh? 
Tell me another and sit down if you don't want to know. That's the title. What do you do when the praise is over? If you're still asking the question in your head, it is because you did not read the last verse chapter of chapter 15. Don't read it right now. Don't read it right now. Read when you get them. I want you to hear me. God threw a stick in the water. And he dismissed the water problem. And the Israelites kept walking. And they came to Elim. Where there were 12 water wells. And 70 palm trees. They had berries and palms. And they camped by the water. Now then. If you still want to know. What to do. When camp meeting is over. And the praise is over. Tell somebody. This black preacher came. This nappy head. Black preacher came. And told you. To look for the wells. When the Israelites got where they were going. God had already. Remember that word? Already provided. Not just one well. But 12 wells of water. If only they had faith and kept walking. And before they got there, the wells were already there. So when it looks like you can't praise, like you can't shout anymore, look for the wells. When it looks like the waters in your life become bitter, look for the wells. Oh, new life. Whatever you need, God will provide Look for the wells. This is yet hope in a dismal situation. Look for the wells. They are the signs and signature that God has already been where you're headed. Look for the wells. They are the imprimatur of a God who keeps his word and provides for our every need. Look for the wells. He promised to lead us to green pastures besides still waters. Look for the wells. The God who led you through the water is the same God who will lead you to the water. He is faithful. New life. He is faithful to his every promise. When the praise is over. Look for the wells like the woman at the well. I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I met the Savior speaking. Draw from my well that never, hey, never, 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 never shall run dry. So fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Fill my cup. I lift it up. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. When you get discouraged, look for the wells. Four nine three, fill my cup, Lord. Sing it, sing it. Let's all rise together. Like a woman at the well, I will see. Slow it down, slow it down. And then I heard my Savior speaking. Draw from my well that never shall run dry. Oh yes, what we do? Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. This thirsting of 
my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who the pleasure of living suffering. Just read those words. But none, none can match the wondrous treasure that I found. That I found in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Fill my cup. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Come and quench this thirsty of my soul. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Feed me still I By the way, this hymn is a prayer. Somebody, would you like to make this prayer your prayer? And any prayer that you pray, God has obligated himself to answer. Are you listening to me, church? Your God loves you too much for you to continue drinking bitter water. He wants to clean up your water, whatever it is. Bad marriage? Huh? Unhappy home? Hmm? More months at the end of the month than shillings. Whatever it is, God wants to fill your cup. As we sing the last stanza, I'm appealing to that person tonight who wants to say, Lord, I want to continue praising you even in my dark moments. If that's your desire as we sing it, I invite you to come for a special prayer so that your bitter water can turn sweet. By the way, that piece of piece of stick that Jesus threw symbolized the cross. The cross made life sweet for the Christian. Sing the last stanza. So my brother, my if this thing or sister, whichever one you want to put it. So my brother, if this things of the world gave you, sing it. Come together. So my children if the come, come, come. Fill my cup. You. Oh yes. Come. God wants God wants God wants to heal you tonight. Oh yes. My blessed Lord will come and save you. If to him if to him. Come, 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 come to Jesus tonight. Come to Jesus. Fill my cup, Lord. Oh, yes, fill it up, fill it up, fill it up. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Stop drinking bitter water. This thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Fill me till I want. Sing that chorus again. Fill my cup, Lord. Oh yes, young man, keep coming, keep coming. God will bless you. Lord. Come, 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 come. Come, come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Feed me.
invite Deacon to come and pray for us tonight. Yes, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come, Brother Shimron. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make. discovered folk just listen to me for a second before he prays I discovered whenever we try to live the Christian life without Christ that's bitter water all we have to do is Lord say Lord like Peter save me you don't have to theologize you don't have to know the 2300 days all you have to say Lord I'm depending on you save me and God will fill your cup until it runs over. And so tonight, I invite you to give your hearts one more time to Jesus. Are you willing to do that, church? One more time. I'm sorry I preached so long tonight. But I had to say all of this to let us know in life there's too much of bitter water. And it'll keep coming. But we have a God who went to the cross. And he freed us. He gave us an opportunity for freedom from sin. And tonight, whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah! Amen. Amen. Pray for us. Our Father and God in heaven, many good things you prepared for us that we will not see and will not think of. We thank you. Oh, I pray that you'll open our eyes and open our minds that we'll be able to see and know that you love and care for us deeply. We have come, each and every one of us here, to lift up our cups that you may fear. Fill our cups. Heal us. Forgive our unbelief. We trust and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to sing. I feel impressed. It's a hymn I love. An old Adventist hymn. We've no abiding city here. You know that hymn? We've no abiding. Let's sing that. Let's try that. I think it's in the 400s. It's not in this hymn, but it's we not? shall try. It's not in here, yes. but you know it. We'll try. We'll from try. The screams. Yes. Okay. We've no abiding city. With no abide, sing it in case we leave. You don't do it. It is a true darkness shall be your home to watch me all your junior walking out alone. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. It shines. It shines with everlasting light. It shines with everlasting light. Oh, sweet apple of To thee and 
be addressed at fly to thee and be I love this in Tanza but hush my soul no you have a place prepared for us no abiding city down here one day Bonn Berlin Georgetown Washington DC Harare Dar es Salaam all these cities Nairobi will be no more but one day New Jerusalem we shall occupy because Jesus is there and so, Father, prepare us for that day when you will come and save us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. we're dismissed. Go with Jesus.